In today's Quickish Art History, we're going to learn more about Rani Lakshmi Bai, who has been portrayed in this statue in Salapur, Maharashtra, charging into battle with a baby on her back. Rani Lakshmi Bai was born on November 19, 1828 in Varanasi, India. She was named Manikarnika Tambi. Her mother died when she was around four years old, and she was educated at home, including learning horsemanship, shooting, and fencing, which was unusual for girls. In May 1842, when she was 14 years old, she was married to the Maharaja of Jansi Gangardhar Rao Newalker, who was 20 years her senior. After her marriage, as was the custom, then her name was changed to Lakshmi Bai, and she was given the title of Rani, or Queen. She was very active as Rani, known to engage in weightlifting, wrestling, and steeplechasing for pre-breakfast exercise. She dressed simply, managed her work professionally, and drilled and trained her own regiment of female guard. Having female guards wasn't unusual for the female quarters of the palace, but the Rani being involved in their training was. Her horsemanship was legendary, said to have been able to ride a horse with the reins in her teeth and two swords in her hand. In 1851, when she was around 23 years old, she gave birth to a boy who died at only four months of age. The Maharaja was childless, so to secure the succession, and because his wife could not rule in her own right, the day before he died, November 21st, 1853, the Maharaja adopted the son of his cousin, who was renamed Damodar Rao. The adoption was done in the presence of a British political officer, and a letter was written to the British that the boy should be treated with respect and that his widow, Rani Lakshmibai, should rule for her lifetime. Jansi had remained independent of British India, then under company rule, the East India Company, while the Maharaja maintained a pro-British stance. So there was no reason, other than the ridiculous mismanagement and greed of the East India Company, for them to refuse to recognize the Rani and her adopted son. But that's how they do. The British annexed her territory, but Rani Lakshmi Bai famously said that she would not give up her Jhansi. Mera Jhansi nahi dengi. But in March 1854, Rani Lakshmi Bai was given an annual pension of 60,000 rupees and ordered to leave the palace and fort. It wasn't because they thought she wasn't competent enough. A British politician wrote of her at the time that she was a woman highly respected and esteemed, and I believe fully capable of doing justice to such a charge. But when the news of the Indian Rebellion of 1857 reached Jhansi, Lakshmi Bai requested permission from the British to raise forces for her defense, and it was granted. When the rebels reached Jhansi, the British were promised to be unharmed if they put down their weapons and left. But this time, it was their turn to be betrayed, and 50 to 60 of the British men, along with their wives and children, were massacred. Then they turned on Lakshmi Bai, threatening to blow up the palace unless she paid them off, so she did. In the aftermath, she took control of Jhansi, writing to the British, who agreed that she should manage the district for the British government. She had set up a foundry to produce cannon to protect her territories both from a rival claim to her husband's throne and from rebel factions who wanted to take Jhansi for themselves. She defeated them all, and she did it without the support of the British, who had by this time decided that the massacre was her fault. From August 1857 to January 1858, there was peace in Jhansi, and this strengthened the local belief that Jhansi should and could be independent of British rule. Yet Rani Lakshmi Bai was still in support of the British. But when the British army, led by Commander Sir Hugh Rose, finally showed up, threatening to destroy Jhansi if they didn't surrender, she had finally had enough. She declared, we fight for independence. In the words of Lord Krishna, we will, if we are victorious, enjoy the fruits of victory. If defeated and killed on the field of battle, we shall surely earn eternal glory and salvation. She raised an army of 14,000 volunteers from a population of 220,000, as well as 15,000 Indian soldiers who had been serving under the British, called Sepoys. Unfortunately, the fighting wasn't going their way, and Lakshmi Bai was forced to flee the palace for the fort, and then to flee the fort for the nearby Gwalior. And that is the moment captured in so many statues and paintings. She was said to have secured her adopted son to her back and rode out sword in hand. However, unlike the depictions of her with an infant on her back, her adoptive son would have been at least 10 years old at the time of her retreat. 
At Gwalior, she could not get the other rebel leaders to cooperate and mount an offensive before the British arrived. Nonetheless, she donned a Sepoy uniform and went into battle alongside the men when the time came. Although accounts differ, she died of injuries sustained while defending Gwalior, and she was cremated by the locals and her remains were buried with the honor due to Arani under the rock of Gwalior. After the fighting, Commander Sir Hugh Rose wrote of her, acknowledging that she was personable, clever, and beautiful, remarkable in her bravery, cleverness, and perseverance, and that she is the most dangerous of all Indian leaders, a sort of Indian Joan of Arc. Twenty years after her death, in 1878, Colonel Mollison wrote that regardless of what the British said of her, that she was ill-treated into rebellion, and that she lived and died for her country. It was this rebellion, caused by the mismanagement and greed of the East India Company, that led to it losing its powers of government in India, and of India coming under direct British rule, establishing Queen Victoria as Empress of India. India did not regain independence until 1947, nearly 90 years after Lakshmi Bai's death. Her story has inspired countless books, films, art, and even video games. It's her image as a warrior queen riding into battle with a baby on her back that is most frequently portrayed. Those of us who enjoy the freedom that baby carriers provide love to see the mama bear fierceness of the scene. You can't do that with a stroller, but is this a fair presentation of her? I've already mentioned the age discrepancy of the child and the fact that she wasn't running into battle, she was running away in retreat. But what about what it says about her as a person? Does this portrayal limit her identity to a maternal trope? The contemporary men who wrote in praise of her never mentioned her maternal side. They praised her for being intelligent, strong, professional, which of course could describe any mother, but are attributes that we to this day tend to associate with men. In fact, many of the articles I read about her describe her as a tomboy. And remember that the child was only adopted because both the people of India and the British did not think a woman should rule without a husband or son, even if they acknowledged that she was capable. She could only be legitimate if there was a male involved. So when we see her portrayed as going into battle on horseback, sword raised, if there was no baby involved, would it have gotten your attention? Would it have been accepted if she wasn't depicted as maternal? What if she was only fighting for her own reign? Would the statue be as famous? Would it even have been created? I don't really have any unifying theory here, but these are some of the things that were going through my mind as I was doing my research on her. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. And if you are interested in helping to support my channel, share this video, or you can become a patron on Patreon. Patrons get behind the scenes info about my research and general goings on. Link is in the doobly doo. Hamsva Tantra Take Le Latte Hem. Nah. It's been 84 years.